Dev Talk Show is live here at 8.30 p.m. on U.S. Eastern Time on September 2nd, our first show of September in the year 2020. Thank you all for joining us. I have my co-hosts, Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross here. And, uh, you know, for everybody that's here, uh, whether you're watching us now or you're watching in the future on YouTube at our uh, always, you can always watch Dev Talk Show at www.thedevtalkshow.com or, or directly you can go to YouTube at video.thedevtalkshow.com and you can see all of our past episodes. And if you're watching them now, you're watching from the future, then don't forget to like this video, you know, hit the subscribe button so you know when we're going live and then let us know what you think about tonight's show on two of the solid principles uh, down in the comments. And we've been talking about solid. We've had a couple shows on uh, we did S, which stands for single responsibility, and we did O, which stands for the open closed principle. And the solid principles generally is this right, Andy, to say that 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 the, that acronym applies to object oriented programming? So those languages. Well, you know, officially they are called. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, they're they're they are the solid principles of object oriented design or something like that. Yeah. And some of them are very object oriented in their nature, right? Um, in particular, um, Liskov substitution principle, which we'll be talking about today. But some of them can, I try to take what I learned from those and apply them even to non object oriented languages, uh, such as single responsibility principle. I mean, I use that on JavaScript, right? I use that in, uh, in SQL uh, and stored procedures, like it, there's so many places you can you can apply these things, right? And and not only that, it's also worth noting that while we're showing demos in C sharp, of course these are just principles and they yes. can apply to any language. So right. Java or you know whatever your language of choice is, right? I'm sure TypeScript you can do a lot of this stuff with, right? Um, yeah, right. Uh, and hey, Chops, I see Chops there in the chat. Hello, Chops. Nice to see you tonight. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, but they are, you know, like officially for object-oriented languages. Okay. Uh, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from these things, you know. Yeah. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, um, you know, when we think about what it means to, like, have principles for programming, we're saying, well, we've talked about this in previous shows, and Andy, you might go into this again, so maybe I'll go ahead and and we can turn it over to you and get ready for you to start talking. I know you usually introduce to us why why are we even talking about programming principles? Don't we just like get on our keyboards and start typing away? <laughs> yeah, the reason you use solid principles is because uh, I guess I was watching a show and Andy said they were cool, so we should <laughs> use them, um, which is clearly not the right reason, right? And I do like to, to talk about that. So for repeat, you know, for our peak customers, uh, you may have heard this this pitch before, but I do think it's important to talk about, um, you know, why we would use solid principles and things like that. Um, it is kind of important. So, Rich, I am sharing my screen. I don't know if you if you saw that. Um, yep. I've got right. a couple slides that just you know talk about a couple things. I feel like it's really important, um, more important than probably uh, understanding the principles themselves. I think is is understanding why these things are important and and really what they help do right. Um, we don't want to fall into this whole golden hammer thing, you know, where we always do everything the same way, right? But we want to look at you know what we want to do, and so we're going to go. Well, we'll go quickly through this because we've talked about some of these things before. But for any newcomer, you know, design principles in general, right? Not just the solid design principles. Design principles in general. You know, we, I, I like to say that, you know, I've got some bullets on here from other presentations, but building software is hard, right? And maintain, maintaining or maintaining, that could be a new, <laughs> maintaining, I like that actually, main changing. Maintaining uh, or changing poorly designed software is costly, costly in money, in time, in missed opportunities that you could be doing other things, right? There's a lot to it. And, and that's not where we want to be spending our time in in being stuck and dealing with problems, right? Fragile code can be buggy, right? Um, and that's costly, right? Changing, you know, this this code that is poorly designed, and that's a you know gray area. What what makes it poorly designed? But we could talk about that as we go through these things. But changing poorly designed uh, code, you know, it, it's hard. And and I don't want to work with hard stuff, right? So. 
quickly, I think, you know, what is the goal that I'm trying to accomplish? It might not be the same goal that you're trying to accomplish. And so that's really important. But I think this is generally true for most people, right? I want my code to be less error prone. I want my apps to be easier to maintain, easier to read, less breakable, more reusable, more decoupled, right? This is like the, this is what we want, right? So it makes sense to you guys, right? This is pretty basic. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I will all, a couple of things, design principles are not implementations, right? So these are ideas. These are concepts that we should follow, but they're not specific about how they are accomplished. So we can show many examples for lots of these things, but that doesn't mean it's the only way or the, or the, or the best way to solve the particular problem that you might be having, right? In, in a given time. Uh, design, they're not patterns. They're, they're just principles. They're not specific about how you achieve the goal. And the solid principles in general, they talk about, uh, and, and uh, Uncle Bob Martin quotes a couple quotes from him, who put, you know, kind of coined the solid principles phrase and put these things together, although he didn't uh, discover or, 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 or uh, create all of these principles, right? But he kind of combined them into the solid principles because solid is an acronym, right, of a bunch of different principles. And so he says, poorly, does it, yeah, it's going to be one of those nights, right? Poor dependency management leads to code that is hard to change, fragile, and non-reusable. Right. And that goes, that's what I said we don't want. Right. So on the other hand, when dependencies and what is a dependency? Well, we'll get into some of that stuff as we go through this. But when dependencies are well managed, the code remains flexible, robust and reusable. That's what I want. Um, and then we, we can get into the principle. Now, these principles aren't the only thing that we should consider. All right. And it's kind of important because I was reading a blog post today and I shared it with uh with uh, Rich and Chris as well today, that I, I was reading a blog post that uh, uh, someone wrote, and they were sort of uh, you know anti-solid principles, right? And I think um, they brought up a couple of interesting points, but you know one of them is that I think they're sort of espoused these days as this this they're not the be all and end all of software development, right? And so let's just be clear about that. These aren't going to solve all your problems. They don't fix everything. They fix a certain th- set of things right does that make sense guys yeah okay sure you know like uh if you're having if you know if your application isn't performing well well then these solid principles may or may not help you i mean i I don't know right most likely not right if your application's a mess when i say a mess what i mean is like you go in to fix something and you can't find it you can't really read the code because it doesn't it's not written, you know, cleanly is a word that gets used around a lot. Um, it, 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 does, it isn't sort of self-documenting and it's hard to sort of follow things. Then maybe solid principles is the kind of thing that would, would help you, right? Now, and that's sort of the overview of the whole thing. Now, we, we went through a couple of them. We went through the single responsibility principle, mm-hmm. which is that a class should have one and only one reason to change. Or many as many people think of it as, you know, you want to keep things small and, and they should only do one thing. Uh, and, you know, we, we have a show on that already. We talked about the open closed principle, which is really uh, saying that basically, you know, your classes should be open for extension and closed for modification. And what that really means is I shouldn't have to open something up and hack at it to add a feature to it, right? It should be open for extension. I should be able to extend that class without having to get in there and tear it apart, right? And change the code of the existing stuff, right? Because that could cause problems. And that is, uh, what is that? That's S and that is O, which brings us to L, right? Um, Now, today, I think we were talking about doing two principles because I think, you know, uh, all things are not equal. And and I think some principles are easier to explain or... um, or just don't take the amount the amount of time to, to to go through, and the samples aren't as maybe not as complex. Now, I did use a bad word. I did say easy. Yeah. Um, and you know, we talked about this in previous shows too. I don't like to say easy too much because I feel like that could be offensive to people. Like, you know, I'll say, oh well, you know, don't you love it when presenters are just like show you a list of like forty things? You're like, see how easy that is? And I'm like, I was lost on step three. Can you can yep. you go back? Um, Everything's easy when you know how it runs. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention, I, I would argue that we're about to tackle the toughest 
of the solid principles. But but let's see. I can't okay. wait to see more about it. Yeah. Well, I hope we have a lot of conversation on this. On the Liskov substitution principle, I honestly don't have that much to show, but I think there's plenty we can talk about, right? So what is the Liskov substitution principle? Yes, Andy. What it is states, the substitution? Yes, what is it? It states that functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. Right. So let's just get into like you know the functions and the pointers, uh, references. Some of that stuff is, I think, an aim at being sort of generic and talking in language, uh, un, you know, unspecific language terminology. Right. This should apply across the board, right? But basically what they're saying is if you reference, uh, let me just get this in my head. So if you reference a base class or, or, or so if you have a method that maybe takes an, uh, another object, it takes a class, right? Or it works with a class, you should be able to put a derived class in its place, right? In other words, a derived class should behave uh, in a way that's consistent with the the root or the base class that it's that it's inherited from, right? And and so that the function in this case it says you know the functions that use pointer the function should be able to do this without knowing about it without deri without use objects of derived classes without knowing it meaning that 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 high level class shouldn't care it shouldn't know am I using the root you know, I'm using that word root class. Am I using the, the base class? Am I using a derived class? I don't care. It doesn't matter to me, right? Because, um, you know, I think I think one of the things that they say about like with Liskov is like, you know, if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck, it's a duck, right? Except when it's not a duck, right? So it's a little, a little confusing. I, I have some samples and I think sometimes code you know, shows this better. And so I'm going to switch over to, um, where's my visual studio here? And I've got some samples. And uh, so, uh, so hello to everybody, by the way, that's out there. And if you're watching and you have a question and you're going, what is he talking about? Jump in, ask some questions in chat. Don't be shy. We love having conversations with everybody included. Um, so, Usually I show an example of what not to do. I think that's a really good way to, to see this, right? And this is probably like the classic example of Liskov substitution principle, quite frankly. When you see talks about this, you see this example. It works really well. It, it makes sense, okay? So I've got this class here called rectangle, right? And this is the kind of thing, you know, you kind of learn in you know, your beginning days of object oriented design, right? You know, you learn about creating a class and then inheriting it from it. I remember early on uh, learning this and then I, I was teaching some Java classes uh, for a while, not like professionally teaching, but like at an employer. And it was always like working with bank accounts. It was like the first thing we teach you about, create a bank account and then inherit it from it. You have a checking account, you have a savings account, right? You're into that early days of inheritance, right? And they teach you the is a, right? And I'll, I'll write that right here just so we, we, you guys know what I'm talking about. Is a, right? Yeah. Is a is how you know, should I inherit something? Well, a checking account is a bank account, right? Okay. Yep. So let's apply that to this example here. And so I am not a mathematician or someone that works with, you know, geometry on a professional level. But I know what a rectangle is, right? Uh, a rectangle has a height and a width, and there's probably some other things that it has, like you can calculate its area and things like that, right? And I know what a square is, right? And I think we all learned in school that a square is a rectangle, right? A specific type, right? It is, it is a type of rectangle, right? There are other types, but a square is one of them. So when we look at this and we think, well, we've got a height and we've got a width. And guess what? A square does have a height and does have a width. Does it not? Yep. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. technically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly does. It has a height and a width. Now, things get interesting when I want to use them interchangeably, right? So first of all, 
The first problem here is if you look at this tester here, right? So let's just say I'm using this in code here and I create a square and then I set the height and I set the width. And I, I hope it doesn't take too much to read the code there and notice what's, what's not going well in that code sample there. Yeah. So while it's a rectangle, <laughs> by definition, it really isn't a square. It's right. It's just not. It does not behave the same way. Right now, are there workarounds for this? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Certainly, I can do this. Right. I can come in here. Oh, I think my num lock was was uh, off there. I can set it to be 100, and I could be careful, and I can treat it that way. But it's a little misleading, right? And it's a little misleading to say, quite frankly, if I was working with a square, I would be asking you, why am I setting both properties? Like that just doesn't make sense to me right? because it's a square and a square only has one. I mean, I don't know what they call it. Is it well, height? Is has, it Honestly. It has both, but they're just equal. Well, that's true. It has both, but they can't be different, right? Yeah. And so, so things get complicated and essentially, a square, this whole is a sort of me mentality or whatever you would call it, isn't really the right way to do it. Uh, so one way people say is you should say, you know, is replaceable by or, or something like that. You know, like you, you rephrase the definition of this inheritance rule that we've been taught. This is a rule. Mm -hmm. And if we start to rephrase this, oh, thank you, Meg, side. Side is the word I was looking for. They don't have a height or width. They have a side. That is, that is, thank you. Um, that was the, that was what was escaping me. But so, yeah. yeah. And so how do we deal with that now? Do we write side, right? We could do some, like there's all kinds of workarounds for this. And when you find yourself doing workarounds, that's a good clue, by the way, that you're kind of going down the wrong path because you're trying to force, hey, how about this? You're trying to force a square into a round hole. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Except that it's we're trying to force a square into a rectangular hole. Yeah, right? well, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you could do something like this. You know, you could have something like public void, I don't know, you know, set side, right? Uh, int x, int x. And uh, then you could do something like, you know, hey, while I'm in here, how about let's set height equals x and width equals x. Yeah. Right? Okay. So sort of feels satisfied, but yet it's not because while the square works right, if I have a method that takes a rectangle as its parameter, I should be able to pass a square in, right? Right. And yeah. so the square works, but when the square is sort of a rectangle, right? Because that's the way inheritance works, right? All this stuff we learn, polymorphism and inheritance and all this kind of stuff, right? Well, I need to be able to use the square in that rectangle spot. And again, now things are back to being broken, right? And so um, when I demo this a lot, you know, the, obviously the next question is, well, then what should we do? What, what's the code sample of, of fixing this? And well, don't do that. Like I don't have a code sample because don't use a square for a rectangle, right? Now, could you have a shape? Sure. Right. You could have a shape and a shape might have some other properties. Right. You could have public. Yeah. So like yeah. a polygon or shape. a shape, whatever you want to do, it doesn't. I, and I wasn't saying polygon to override what you yeah, were saying. Yeah. They <laughs> all have area. Like right. That's, exactly. Right. They're so all going to have like that. Right. Public void calculate area, something like that. Right. Right. You could do that. Oh, well, it wouldn't be void, of course, right? Let's just say it's it's probably not an int, but I'll just make it an int for now, right? We could do that, okay? And then, uh, sorry, return zero, because we're not really about writing the actual code here. Um, so now we have something. Now I could take shape, and I could say that a square inherits from shape. Or this, well, it doesn't really matter. And, you know, and a rectangle inherits from shape, right? Uh, so now good. maybe this is going to be abstract or something like that, right? Uh, cause I don't think you can really have, maybe you can have a shape, maybe you can't, but we need to make sure we, you know, we, we have to implement, uh, you know, I'm not writing exact code here, but we have to implement 
calculate area in these things. And that's great because they have different formulas for calculate area, right? Yeah. Um, so, by the way, I see some stuff in the chat. I just want to get caught up. Uh, so, uh, when would you use, why would you use Visual Studio? Is that a joke? Uh, no, I no think, I mean, look, well, oh. the point tonight yeah. is we're just using, we just picked a code editor in a language, right? This yeah. is yeah. about yeah. the solid principles. Right. Yeah. You could do this us. in Java. You could do this in Python. You could do this in uh, just about any object-oriented yeah. language and even some not object-oriented languages, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, like, just to answer this quick question, there is uh, there is type inference in C Sharp using the var keyword, which you're just not seeing in Andy's code, both ways of, of explicit. And, and actually, you wouldn't be able to use type inference in these declarations, yeah, right, for right. your declaring. Um, but but in other code, you can say, um, you know, var x equals and basically it will infer uh, the type, right? And Will, so, Will does say it was a joke, by the way. So, but but it's a fair question that Chris's yeah. answer. Right? We, we, this is this is all very sort of generic. Uh, these principles and these things um, about that. And yeah. Um, by the way, Meg is asking because she's new to C sharp, and I don't mind taking a quick detour. What is the difference between public void uh, and public int? So the int in the class uh, right here, set aside, or where was the, oh, here's a calculate area. This is yeah. the return type. So we're saying it's public, meaning that anyone who has an instance of this uh, class can call this method. And we're saying that it would take these parameters, whatever we put here, we might take an int x and an int y, although it probably wouldn't in this case, but you know we can pass parameters into it, right? Uh, and then the int is what is the return value. So in this case, it has to return zero. If it was void, it means there is no return type. But when you're calculating area, um, often you would want to return that. I could set that, though. There's other ways you, know, you could do this kind of stuff. But that's kind of the, the basics behind uh, public void yeah. versus public uh, int. And I ho hope that was enough for Meg. Right. Um, we just right happen there. to be in a language where you have to, when, when you are writing functions you don't have any other way except to say okay i've got to tell you what my return type is and i've got to tell you right. the types that i accept in but other parts of the code there is type inference yeah right. um you can't do that in that whereas if you if you know if you go back to like c plus plus remember you had like the public code block and then you put all the functions that were public in there and the private code block you put all on there well when java came to the fore they said well why are we doing that why don't we just throw that on the, the function definition or the method definition and C sharp picked right. that up as well. And, uh, you know, we don't mind, uh, Meg's a friend of the show, right? We're, we don't mind uh, yeah. taking little detours, explaining things. Yeah. If other people I, have some questions and things like that, you know, we, we, we can take a little side. That's, that's the nature yeah. of this show. It's conversational yeah. and things like that. So, but I um, think to your point, Andy, is if we're talking about the Liskov substitution principle, we're talking about the fact that in later code, you right. might pass a class, you might right. pass it a shape, yeah. or, or you might have given it a rectangle. Right. And, the, so and, can... and that would have been perfectly valid for that code to exist. But then later, somebody creates this square, and this square derives from rectangle. And our previous square, you know, since it derived from rectangle, you could set heights and widths. And so that old code that got a rectangle would try to do that, and it would be wrong for a square. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort so, of like take out some of the stuff we were playing with there. Yeah, so we're say, definitely not trying to get too. I mean, trust me, we're not trying to say questions aren't important and valuable. They every question is, but I think part of it is to say that hey, if you if you used a, a, an inheritance based language, and you created a square that derived from a rectangle, but that rectangle had height and width, height and width, it's it's kind of broken for a square. I mean, yes, it does have height and width, but what would it mean for older code to take that square in, to be past that square, but it doesn't know it's a square. It thinks it's a rectangle, so it sets a different value for each. What should square do? Should it throw an exception? And if it did that, how would old code even know to expect that exception? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of like an example. I, I, I haven't really gone through the whole thing, but let's just say we were doing something like this, like y dot... Uh, with, uh, sorry, r dot with, I mean, this is probably not code I would write in the first place, but sure. 
let's say I have a method that takes a rectangle, it's expecting this thing, and I can then set both of these things. And so I could pass in, so now I could do this, I guess, in here. I could say something like set, and I could pass in a square, uh, and say 100, 200. Right. Um, and, and that and code probably, was valid. I convert from not square. I don't know what I did. I'm, you know. <laughs> like that that code was perfectly valid. Like if, if no one had ever set out to create the square type, you could have used rectangle for decades and it would have been perfectly fine. And then all of a sudden somebody comes along and says, hey, in my math, my math class, which is this is true, right? Told me a square is just a type of rectangle. So right. therefore, in object oriented programming, I should derive off of rectangle. But now you've broken all this old code that doesn't know what to do with yeah. With a, yeah. with, a, with a rectangle that can have a different height and a width, and it just doesn't right. know, right? And, and right. That's it was working fine when we had all this other stuff, but someone added a new feature, and we tried to pass something else in, and we broke the whole thing kind of thing. Right, and so the, the Liskov substitution principle, you know, um, which was, uh, you know, first noted in a paper um, by Barbara Liskov, uh, an MIT professor, you know, she said that, that types should have contravariance and covariance, which, which, which is just a fancy way of saying you should be able to pass the base types without caring about what derived type you actually got. You should be able to accept, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. You should be able to accept as parameters the base type without caring what derived type you got. And it should, and you shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. And you shouldn't be like, wow, what's this unexpected unequal sides exception that the square class threw? So... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Unequals. Unequal, exactly. That's a good. Yeah, that's a good example. But so, I mean, the thing is this, right? Um, I don't usually s spend that much time on this principle because I think it it's sort of it's honestly not the one that comes up as often for me in like the code I'm writing. And maybe that's just the nature of the code I write. Um, I find like you know, we've talked about the single responsibility principle. We've talked about open closed. Like those are principles that on a day to day basis when I'm writing code, like I'm thinking about those things. Right. Um, this one, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just the, the types of stuff I work on, but I really don't. Don't really. So here's uh, the thing. Yeah. My belief, and this is just me, is I really think this is the hardest principle to foresee. I think it's very easy to write code and then later write new, well, so here's the thing. It depends on if you really heavily rely on inheritance. And I think it's probably, I'd love to know what you, you think, Rich and Andy, but I think here in the year 2020 compared to, to 2002 when .NET went 1.0, I feel like inheritance is not something we reach for or are told to reach for as developers the way maybe you did back, I'm going to even go back before, net but like an mfc where the entire win 32 windowing system was had this inheritance hierarchy and there was a a poster that was on the wall that you could see the whole inheritance hierarchy of of the of you know a grid picker who had a had a had a button and an up down thing and whatever right. um i feel like our industry has kind of has kind of said inheritance you know, if you use it too much, you really hurt yourself. And I actually think it's because we violated this principle all the time. <laughs> well, you've kind of brought it full circle the way you, the way you just brought it back to the why, right? But I think you're. I completely agree with you. I don't. I don't use inheritance that much. I mean, I think I use it where it's appropriate. I, I hope. Um, but my first instinct isn't to like create this hierarchy of, of classes. Like I, I, it just doesn't come up that often, quite frankly, like, and, you know, I have base classes that I use for certain things. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't do it that often. Right. I think there's uh, yeah. other I things think we, that I, other tools that are in the toolkit, you know, I think we've changed the way we write code. I think when Java and .NET were new interfaces were not on people's radars because they were maybe coming over from VB. So they wouldn't think about this anyway. And, mm. or they would, they were coming over from C plus plus where there were no interfaces, but right. there were abstract base classes. And so right. if you were coming right. from C plus plus, you were like, let's go build an inheritance hierarchy. Yes. And then, exactly. And then it blows up on you later. 
And it's, right. it's and really hard to keep right. And it's because and what Barbara Liskos was warning us of like, look, you violate this principle. Your code's not maintainable. Right. And so just to go back, uh, I, I like what people are saying in the chat about um, unit testing and stuff like that. Awesome. Right. But I don't think testing was going to solve this problem. Testing wasn't yeah. going to reveal this problem because of what Chris said. We started with a rectangle and everything was working great. There is no square. I could we haven't invented square yet. And so I'm not writing tests against square. Right. It's not till two years later when we're in the code and someone goes, hey, I have this idea for this thing called a square and it's a rectangle. So can't you pass it down and can't you use it in all those places? And all of a sudden the thing breaks. Right. right? Yeah. I, so I think it, it's a little don't get me wrong. Testing, you know, testing for the win. Right. Like testing is great. But I don't know. Like this is a principle that like, yes, testing will help in, in a lot of these cases. But. That, that's why some of these these are design principles that like you sort of need to bake in your you know like you just have to consume these things and understand them and, and make sure that you're thinking about it because it's 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 to prevent it's for it's to prevent you from having to rewrite your application like three years from now because of some yeah you know flaw that you introduced that wasn't really testable I think I don't know that's that's just my so I but, think yeah. I think it's a little important to note, like Meg said, it's weird because Ruby is about inheritance is that I, I don't I want to make it very clear that when we talk about what I think has happened in the C sharp and, and Java space to prefer interfaces. And we're going to talk about interfaces in a little bit uh, mm -hmm. over implementations. I think it's because of the design of those languages. And and so try not to. Um, take too much of this back to Ruby because I think, Meg, you could teach us a lot about mix-ins, which I do not have my head fully wrapped around. So um, it's really important to note that in the C Sharp and, C and Java world, um, you design a base class, you're, you can only inherit from one class. There's no multiple inheritance. There's no mix-ins. Um, the way that we inherit multiple abstractions is through interfaces. And so like we talk about this example here with the square and the rectangle and it seems so like, okay, I, it's, it's abstract. What if you built a payment processor and in your payment processor, you said, Hey, what do I do to, what do I do when I take payments? Well, first I want to take the, the, the account number and then I want to check that it's fraudulent. And you think that's natural for anyone who accepts payments, but you've actually set yourself up for a Liskov violation later when marketing comes back and says, oh, you know what a form of payment is? A gift card. And there's no fraud detection for that. Oops, because we built that into our payment processor. Mm, so yeah. so it's it's the point of me coming up with that example is to say that unit testing didn't save you because marketing came to you years later and said, we're now introducing a gift card program and you baked in fraud detection into your base class. Well, you're not going to derive off of payment processor for your gift card processor. You're going to have to redo your abstractions, right? By the way, uh, and, and that's, that's a great example. Um, I was just thinking, you know, here's an idea for a show about like, you know, just throwing us out there. Like, I don't know Ruby, right? Maybe Meg can give us a lesson on Ruby one day because I'm, I don't know anything about it. You know, like uh, I would like to learn something like that. It'd be kind of interesting. Oh, I think an intro uh, to Ruby would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be kind of fun, right? Um, because a lot of times when we do these shows, someone will say, well, how would you do that in this language or something? Like, I, I don't know. I never used Ruby, you know, something like that. So that, that might be kind of fun. But um, so I don't know. Like that's, to me, this is, this is, all I've got on on this principle, you know, like it is what it is. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, that's why we were going to do two of them in one night. And that's yeah. why I said in my tweet, by the way, two for the price of none. So, Will, I, I'm an old C++ programmer that has not kept up with modern C++. Oh and I love how you've mentioned this because earlier you mentioned auto and type inference. And there was no type inference in C++ when I did C++. It it wasn't there. It didn't exist. And the fact that it's did there now is fantastic. 
And uh, and I really would like to learn more about it. In fact, there's a lot of modern C++ projects, especially like, say, a DirectX type project that really interests me to kind of get me back into C++ and understand the modern usage of the language. Um, but, you know, as you can see, if you come from C++, you can see that we're we have to say as part of our method definition, which is we called functions or methods, I guess, in classes, right? We, we have to go ahead and say everything about it. We have to say that it's public, void, whatever, where in C++, you, you have your public block and your private block and your protected block. That's the only difference there. But I'm no expert, and it's I'm really glad that you're here because it's awesome to have a C++ uh, expert in the chat. I think that's awesome. Got a good mix of people, uh, different languages that people yeah. are using. From the and chat that's why so it's, it's the nice dev talk us. show, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. that's what we're talking about here, Dev. And we talk about, um, you know, like like one of the things we try to say is like, you know, how does this stuff work in the real world? And and Chris brought up the point about we don't even use inherited in, in .NET. You know, we're just not. I don't know. Some people probably use it a lot. We're not. That's the real world for me. Like this isn't a principle that comes up on a day to day basis. And so I don't know. I guess you could say all principles are not created equal, or you know, or, or whatever. But um, but. No, you know, people important. say, like, where should I start with the solid principles? You know, I always say, like, you know, start with the single responsibility principle. It's like a great place to put into everything. I think, you know? Yeah, I think most people feel that's the most valuable. It's the one you can use everywhere. Right. This is the one. And I know I know at the beginning you said there's not much to say about it. This is the one that I I was glad to talk about purely because I think it's the, the it's the silent stalker that you wrote some code five years ago and it's it's important it's part of your product your company you're not right. starting over you're not going to start your project over you're not going to start what you're yeah. doing over and yet now somebody has somebody on your team has what seems like the right idea to derive off of a off of another class except that what happens is is when they're trying to implement everything they go oh you know that doesn't really apply to me let me throw a not implemented exception which is like yeah is it and that's in it's in the framework the not implemented <laughs> not exception impl is in the framework so it's calling our developers like just use this but that that might as well be this is the Liskov substitution principle violation exception like that's uh. what it means <laughs> right yeah that's great <laughs> That's really Do awesome. I, yeah. So, um, you know, oh, there's you guys really see me great... rubbing my eyes a lot. My allergies are really bad today. Uh, we had workers in the house, and I think they blew around a lot of dust, and I'm just scratchy and itchy tonight. So I apologize for that. Yeah, there's some really great questions where, like, can you say you'll run into each principle a lot throughout your career? I think the answer is no. Um, I think that depending on the language you choose, Languages have things, different ways to work around these things. Like C++ doesn't have interfaces. Um, C Sharp, Java, uh, you know, look, I don't know where interfaces came from. I'm not enough of a computer scientist to tell you that I know they came from Java, but I know they were popularized in the, in the commercial enterprise, people who go to work and write code languages by Java. And the reason they came into Java is they made a design decision in Java no multiple inheritance, but then how am I going to inherit multiple abstractions? Because you need that. Um, when we talked about that payment processor earlier, what really happens is you realize that you need a processor that takes an interface for fraud detection and an interface for, for uh, I don't know, account processing. And, and then so your gift card processor implements one, but your credit card processor implements both because it needs both abstractions. And and the Liskov substitution at least the principle at least warns you. It's like that. Hey, just be aware that this can happen to you later, right? Right. So. Yeah, it's like uh, there's, there's a lot to there's a lot that we need to look out for. You know, can we run into these things? You know, in a in a year, I think it depends on the kind of code you're writing and the kind of focus you have. I mean, theoretically, you might not ever run into you know, these things. I mean, because sometimes things are small. Some people would argue, right? And this is a conversation to have, right? Some people would say, I'm just writing something small. You know, it's 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 a little, you know, a little console app, little utility thing. It's not that big a deal, you know. Uh, and But those are valuable, these small things, right? So do we need to put all these principles into place when we're writing those kind of things? 
Yeah, right, right. And and I also think it's important that that everybody here learning this maybe for the first time, don't walk away from this afraid and worry about the lines of code you write tomorrow. I don't think that's what we're here to say. That's not what it's about. It's so that when you get into this situation in the future, you, you'll you spot it and you'll say, gosh, I, I know what this is now. And then you might remember the word Liskoff and you'll run over to, a, you know, to Google and you'll it'll refresh your memory. It's not meant to be remember this tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's these are concepts. We're throwing out things and then you'll be like, right, like like. You're looking at code and it's a, you know, whatever, maybe not in this case, but like you talk about single responsibility principle, you're looking at code and you're thinking, wow, I, I have so much in here. It's so hard to follow. I can't refactor it because it's doing all these different things. And that's one of those ones where it goes like, ding, aha, right? Um, that's what, yeah. that's what they're talking about, you know? So um, I think we've got another principle we yeah. want to hit tonight. And maybe yeah. while, I, while I let you switch over for that. We, I just want to remind everybody that if you're watching us live on Twitch, don't forget to hit that follow button, that heart button. Oh, yeah. If you're watching on desktop, if you're watching on mobile, it's there too. That way you'll know when we go live and you can watch um, videos for a short time here on Twitch. I think, I don't know if it's uh, two weeks or a month, but if you're watching us on YouTube because you're watching in the future, or even if you're watching right now live, don't forget every show is archived at uh, video.thedevtalkshow.com which really just shoots you over to our YouTube channel. You subscribe there, like the shows where you like the topics. That way we know those are the topics you want to see. You know, if you didn't like a topic, go ahead and hit the dislike button. That way we know that, hey, maybe that wasn't the best show. Maybe it wasn't something we should focus on. And we want to talk about the things you want to talk about so that you can join in and teach us just like you're doing tonight, right? Um, we had some really great points in the chat here. I wish I could get to all of them, but like Meg just pointed out, you know, she says, Hey, I'm going to do a talk for Philly.net's code camp. And I know that Philly.net is a .net oriented group, but we welcome, we .net developers can't just focus on, on, in our tunnel with our, more than ever, we have to be aware of the world outside of us, you know, uh, different languages, you know, even you see Microsoft evangelizing uh work that they're doing they're using python they're using they're using java that the java azure spring boot service just launched right so so this is no longer a live in your bubble world so it'll be great to have meg there i know she's local to philly but anybody here will be able to watch that and and you know when we get more information on it i'm we will we're you know philly.net's a friend of the show we're definitely all from that group we'll definitely let you know about that code camp and then, you know, I think you already started to answer this um, a little bit where um, we got this great comment that, hey, you know, he said, hello, I haven't been developing for the past 16 years. Is UML still valid in app design nowadays? And uh, I never learned UML. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if it was ever valid. I mean, my, yeah. I remember like early on, they wanted us using that stuff. Yes. Rich, is that something you used, UML? In the past, probably Thousands was probably the last time I'd used it with a couple of enterprise applications, but that's kind of what it, uh, I, that's where I refer to it too. It's usually one of those large enterprise uh, in implementations where they've got those. Right. In Hello? Did we lose Rich maybe for a second yeah, there? I, maybe a second. I lost Rich's audio. No, I think he's coming back. Yeah, that was it. Okay. okay. I think we, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what? I think of, I don't know, when I think of UML and maybe I'm wrong, but you know, like what Rich is talking about with these, you know, big enterprise projects, I think of like waterfall, you know, yeah. where like, it's all like, you know, and there's these, these big charts on the wall, right. Of like all these diagrams. I don't know. Um, it, it was how they I never the liked process, right? Right, exactly. I never liked it, uh, probably because I never mastered it, because it probably wasn't exciting enough to me when I was learning code, and I really wanted to just get my hands in there and start typing, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think we're... Yeah. We're, so we have another in, letter in solid, and it's yeah. I. Oh, yeah. You know what? I guess, technically, I should show this. Uh, let me just bring up the slide here. Yeah. Interface segregation principle. Clients should not be forced to depend upon interfaces that they don't use, right? This is 
this is almost like the be nice to other developers principle, right? Because you you build these interfaces that are like big and complicated. And then the people that come afterwards that come along to implement your interface are now stuck with having to Im- implement the whole thing. And they're like, I don't want that, right? So wh- wh- why wouldn't they want that? Well, let's, let's, let's look at some examples, okay? So by the way, uh, in our first show on this, when we talked about single responsibility, I had this customer service that was good at like getting customers and adding customers or moving. By the way, here's Chris's favorite uh, not implemented exception. Um, so uh, just throwing it on here because it's just- We're gonna you know, pretend simple. there's code there, right? That's yeah, not- Yeah, we're just pretending not, there's code here, right? Yeah. That's, I yep. know, it's not the same thing. So we talked about this, again, we were talking about the single responsibility principle and we thought like, well, we are talking about like, where do we, where do we, where does this single responsibility principle begin and end, right? A class should only do one thing. Well, that should it only do get customer? Mm, it's probably okay that it works with customers. Maybe it works with data access for customers. So I can add a customer, get a customer, remove a customer, update a customer. But then I started showing, yeah, but what about like add to shopping cart and calculate customer tax records and get customer feedback and get customers by location, get customers by product group, rank customers by feedback. I started making up all these, whatever I could think of. These are you know, somewhat contrived examples here. I'm just like throwing stuff out there. Like these are things, right? And let's just say we weren't following the single responsibility principle because this isn't very single responsibility. But I was thinking about it today in this demo and I'm like, you know, we could use this. And so what do we usually do? We we might have this whole big class and we have an implement, we have a, 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 a an interface for it. And the interface is just as bad, right? So let's just say we flip the story around and I have this interface for a customer service. And then Chris, uh, you want to add a customer. So you're gonna create, you know, and whatever it is, you know, you need to use this customer service uh, interface to to do that. So you're gonna implement this interface and all you really wanna do is let's say add a customer. And now you're forced to do what I just did, which is like implement all these things and maybe throw in those not implemented exceptions or which is like a really bad idea. Uh, Or you have to implement all these things and and that's probably not really what you wanted to do. So what we could do, and I'm in the not section of my little solution here, so this is the not. Um, And so I could do something like this, okay? I could have that same customer service, by the way. Well, let's flip it around the other way. What if I was a nice developer, nice to Chris, because Chris and I are working together in this imaginary scenario, and I made this customer service that has maybe these basic methods. And then I say, well, let's have a customer rank service or I customer rank service that handles the ranking stuff, right? And the customer search service that does these searching related kind of methods, you know, and all these different things. And I've separated these things out. I've segregated interface segregation principle. I've segregated out these pieces of the interface. Now, how do I implement these? Well, the interesting thing is, and and Chris kind of talked about this before, I could implement them all in the same class, right? (laughs) So I could just do this but I don't have to, right? And I I probably wouldn't do that, right? Like maybe I have this base customer, well, not base, but I have a customer service that does all these things and so that's fine. But when Chris needs to do it, maybe he comes over and, and, you know, Chris has the second customer service and all it implements is the I customer service, right? For these methods, I was goofing around with some examples and maybe, Maybe I implement a second interface, like it's up to it's up to us. What do we want to do? But when we need the customer rank service, I it's not all combined, right? Does that make sense? I can implement these separately. I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, and I'm not forcing people to this <laughs> inheritance, right? I'm not forcing people to have to deal with things that they don't care about. If we're adding something and we care about ranking, why should you have to implement the shopping cart to do the ranking, right? So that's that's one example. Um, and I have some others. Does that example make sense? Because, you know, I kind of try yeah. to explain, you know. Yeah. I mean, the idea is that you're trying to, to – so, so in 
first of all, we're lucky that the interface segregation principle is called that because it directly maps to Java and C Sharp's term interfaces. Um, I'm not a TypeScript expert, but I think TypeScript has the identical concept. And in C++, I think it's fair to say that an interface is an abstract base class with no implementation. If you start writing implementation, you're not an interface anymore, yeah, right? That sounds uh, right to me. I say that, and then of course we could talk about C Sharp's default implementation feature, and we're not going to talk about that at all. I didn't even say that. So, um, the idea is to say, let's say you're we're good developers, and we followed the advice to program to interfaces, not implementations. Well, what's one of the first mistakes you make is you write these really large interfaces and then right. you as the, the person building the system, you know, I'm building the system. I know what to do with people with, with code that implements the customer rank service. Like if you implemented one for your website to rank customers and I implemented one for my uh, shopping app and Rich did and Meg did and Will did and, and, and I, and I, but now we have the central program the central server that knows what to do with the ranking services wouldn't it be horrible if your shopping site had no customer ranking like it just didn't have it but right. yet you're trying to implement your website and you've got to put in code for rank customers by feedback and you said that concept doesn't even exist for me so right. what are you going to do you're probably going to reach for the not implemented exception <laughs> in <Right>. c sharp <laughs> Do you? I, I, this is one for the for the .NET developers of the on the show that are watching. But I'm trying to remember what this was uh, because it's been a while. This used to be my old standard example of this, but there was this. Uh, oh, membership providers. Do you remember membership yes. providers? Right. Yeah, and I do. you know the example was that in order to use a membership was like you know a library that was you know for logging in and and managing you know members of like a website or you know something like that. Yep. And uh, there would over and over again, you would see these examples. Well, if you want to customize membership for your thing and use a different like authentication mechanism, you would have to implement the membership provider. Yeah. But the only way to implement the membership provider was to have, there was, there, there must've been 60 methods on the thing. Yeah. And you yeah. had to inherit from it and you had to implement every one of them. Yep. And then actually at first, I don't even think non implemented exception existed in .NET. Okay. I could be wrong about that. Nah. But did you write one uh, of those? One of those custom yeah. membership providers? It, it oh, was yeah. clearly designed oh, okay. to go to SQL Server, right? Like they designed exactly. Exactly. the membership yeah, provider exactly. to go to SQL Server, but then they let you implement your own. Yeah. But what if you were just like saving it to memory or something? Right. right. It was. It was so bad, right? And everybody hated doing it. And yeah. it was a great example, but it's just not as current anymore. But yeah. I've got some other examples that sort of, I, you know, I think this kind of stuff makes sense, right? Like we see this get customer and we realize it's different than the rank customer, right? But this is an example of something. Um, let me go to nah, not. OK, this kind of basic thing. Now, this isn't a lesson on the repository pattern. This isn't a lesson on generics. I don't want to get into all that, whether you should use the repository pattern. But in this case, there's this repository and it has all these things like find and get and add and update. And delete, of course, right? And so what I find, and this happens pretty regularly, I've got some base classes that I use all the time. And I find that, you know, a lot of times I have data that's read only, right? This is like a common scenario. I have classes, tables, however you want to work on it, you know, that, that I get data from my application, but there is no way to change the data, right? It's not part of this application or system or anything like that. And so what I generally do is something like this. I'll create an interface called I read only repository and you can have whatever methods in there you want. This is just two examples, right? A find by ID and a get, right? And expand upon that to your heart's content. That's not the point, right? But then what I'll do is I'll have an I writable repository, okay? And it has add and update and delete, right? And I've even gone so far as to sometimes take delete out and make it like a deletable because some systems don't have a delete. The, you know, you might be able to update data, but there is no delete, sure. right? And so then you could have a, an interface, you know, I'm sorry, you could have a repository that implements both of these or even 
maybe another scenario would be something like this because tr usually if you're writing data, you're also reading data, right? That, that, that scenario isn't as, as common to have one or not the other. But now when I'm going to make my repositories, uh, I only implement the stuff I need, right? Even though it's generic, you could say, what's the big deal, Andy? But it's misleading too, right? It's misleading to say that we have writable things that aren't writable. Right, yeah. Like if you're implementing, if for some reason you're using a system that, that requires you to implement these interfaces, right? And I'm implementing a bank ledger. I can't delete from the bank ledger. Exactly. You can never delete from bank ledgers. And so now you've, what am I supposed to do when I implement that interface? Am I supposed to, am I supposed to like use not implemented it? I'm going to go back. That's like the joke of the, of the night, right? Um, and that I think is kind of what Will was talking about is he said from a user perspective, a programmer using a library, uh, dealing with the interface segregation principle, is it more about reducing the number of interfaces you have to satisfy or reducing the amount of code bloat when instantiating an object? Um, I, I think what's well, it's in the form of a question, but I almost just kind of want to say yes, right? Exactly. I, I almost just want to say yes. And then, and then, in I think the third piece is what we've sort of discovered here, is it's is it's about preventing that implementer from having to hack around your mistaken interface that made them implement a method that's meaningless to their situation. Right. So you're kind of what 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 Will's saying um, is that you know it, it does reduce code blow. Like, why should someone? It, it, I kind of used the example earlier. We're saying it's just like being nice to the developers that come after you. Like, why make them go through that when they don't need it, right? Um, and uh, and it, it tends to lead to single responsibility principle. You could get into this whole twisting area where you could say, well, kind of relates to Liskov because, you know, the substitution of these things. And you could say that um, well, single uh, responsibility, then, right? single responsibility, and then you could define methods, right, that only take an I read only repository. Now, listen, if your repository supports writing, that's okay, because it will work as an I read only repository using like Liskov, like it will be substitutable in that case, right? And so that's where these things do kind of come together, right? Um, and, and make you think about it like differently. But yeah, reduce code bloat, right? And reduce not having to satisfy these these um, these rules, right? That's what you know. I was always taught that the uh, an interface is like a contract, right? And why are we putting things in a contract that don't need to be there, right? Make it make it right. Simple, right? Yeah, and then you know what's interesting is is as you see these start to tie together, right? This yeah. the. The interface segregation principle, and I and it is way too simplistic for me to say this, so kind of forgive me. It's leading you towards single responsibility. It's pointing that direction. Make sure that your interfaces only handle the tasks that a client would want to to implement. Um, and then you know, I've seen the sort of tongue in cheek. I've seen this sort of tongue in cheek that that if you whittle every interface down, to a single responsibility, then your interfaces have one function. And if you get to that, maybe you should just use a functional language, right? So I've seen that said in a tongue in cheek fashion. Um, I will tell you what I have done, and this is for the .NET developers out there, is when confronted with the choice of, okay, so we had a legacy system that um, it consumed modules and the modules implemented interfaces. If you changed the interfaces, the modules all had to be recompiled, right? Right. Imagine a scenario where your customers don't want to recompile because, like, first of all, they may not know that you changed your system. So this has nothing to do with the interface segregation principle, but if you get down to the point where your interfaces are... There's, there's a C-sharp feature... There's funk and there's action, right? So imagine if you didn't use interfaces at all and you just said, we'll accept funks, which are basically functions that have at least uh, a return type and actions, which are void functions, right? And you said, okay, now you never have to update your assemblies 
because our engine is going to be looking for new funks or actions to implement. Um, because, you know, some people have implemented these assemblies and they've gone out of business and they've gone away. And so we can't change the core engine anymore. <laughs> what a predicament to be in. Uh, <laughs> but it was a tweaky way to use what's in C Sharp to, uh, to even like implement new interfaces without implementing interfaces. <laughs> It has nothing to do with the interface segregation principle, but it got me thinking of it because of the fact that eventually you get to a place where, like, what is an interface with one method? What is that, really? Is that just yeah. a function signature that you're willing to take? Would you take a duct-typed version of that? Yeah, that's an interesting... It's an interesting question. I mean, to some degree, I don't think this is so bad, though. Like, this is specific, um, and it doesn't really hurt to do this. Like I would rather someone do this than, you know, if you're going to err one way or the other, would you rather see this or would you rather see, where was it? You know, customer service, right? Yeah. This one, right. Would you rather see this? Right. I, I I'd rather see them just, it's not that big a deal. I can implement all those interfaces. I can put them back into the same class. Is kind of what I was saying with my, with that first example, you know, when uh, you have to implement something, would you be annoyed if you saw this and said, okay, so I'm going to use this product. I really like this product. I can't wait to use this product. But look, I've got to implement a class that 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 I have to write a class, put the little colon, and say, I add repository. I update okay. repository. I delete. Would that annoy you? Well, I would like to think that they were – that the developers were smart about there it. There was right? a good reason. So yeah, like there was a reason to separate add from update. Like maybe update is pretty rare. Like like what I was saying before, like read only versus writable data. Like to me, that you know, there's definitely a, a likelihood that that's going to occur. In this case, certainly adding an update are are pretty different. But like remember what I said before about delete. Well, delete is something I could see being moved out of there. You know, and maybe you have a, just a delete repository because. Some repositories support deleting and some don't. Um, you know, historical data can't be deleted. So why have a delete method, right? Um, I don't know. These are these are sort of like, again, that's why we have discussions on these things, right? And, yeah, and right. In, our, in our show, we're not just simply saying do this. We're saying, oh, you know, sometimes there's a time to do this. Sometimes there's a time to do something else. We all have different scenarios. We all need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of these principles and and think about them and then try to apply them as best we can you know and will we get it right sometimes we'll get it wrong maybe we'll go too far and we'll split these two out and we're like oh god that was a pain in the neck but that's how we learn right we still we lived with it for a year and then we look back and go you know i'm working on that app that rich wrote you know and i'm like why did rich split up that ad and that update i'm throwing rich under the bus on this one you know why did he do that and so i'm going to say you know what when i'm writing my next app i'm not going to do that i'm not going to be that kind of developer like rich was i'm going to go out and <laughs> <laughs> well isn't it super painful rich is when, laughing. i don't when, know yeah. come on rich <laughs> give me a hard time here. he's so quiet i just feel he's quiet on this show tonight as somebody <laughs> You know, who has to live with what comes from the .NET based class libraries, right? Isn't it painful when maybe they do get this a little wrong and even admit that they have? Like, you know, maybe we shouldn't have made this public or we shouldn't have made this protected or heck, remember the whole debate about like sealed classes, right? So I would love to see... I mean, you know, that's getting a little off the topic. So if you've got more on interface segregation, Andy, let's see that. And yeah, maybe it'll I got be interesting. Sort of to, one more example that yeah. again, I think it can be a quick example. But you know, we're talking here about about methods, right? And interfaces on methods, right? And I just want to remind people that you know we can have an interface uh, that we use for like an object, right? And this is a this is a actually a real example of the stuff I've used at work where we have this thing called an entity because we're using, in this case, we're using entity framework or something like that. 
And this is like a base class for things that we save in the database a lot, right? Or things we, we persist, I'll say. And so what happens? They typically have an ID that's an integer. And then a lot of times we have this kind of stuff, right? Uh, where we have like a create date, a create user by, a cr sorry, a created by user. And, and some of those kind of like, I call them like auditing fields. Um, I don't know if this is something that, you know, sort of, is familiar to, to the viewers, but I think a lot of people have stuff like this. So um, the problem with this now is I've got this cool stuff in here. And let's say um, we have an object that also, you know, there's, a, uh, there's something that has like a GUID for an ID, which, you know, some people, let's not get into the debate about whether GUID should be an ID or not, but I've got a GUID for an ID. Well, now I'm stuck. I can't implement I entity, right? Uh, and I'd like to. So the simple thing here is, you know, what if we split these interfaces out and we say, well, let's have something called I auditable, which has those audit fields and be really specific. Oh, and this one doesn't have an inter implementation. So that's pretty weak or um, I didn't put that in there. Let's grab that out of this thing. Right. Um, so, you know, and split these into two different classes. Right. And then, of uh, sorry, two different interfaces. Then, of course, our something object, right, can always do both of these, but it doesn't have to, right? And I could easily do something else. Let's so then you can have something else. Go ahead. Uh, you're uh, you're going where I was thinking. Go ahead. Yeah. Where it doesn't implement the ID, but you could also have an I GUID ID as a for your use you case. Could have, you could have uh, your ID is different. Sir. Right, certainly. But the important thing is that there's probably some method that takes an I auditable, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, and I, I think I kind of remember even doing this, where somewhere in my saving logic, right, somewhere in this logic, you know, whatever the saving logic is, there's some, well, no, that's not really what I wanted, but some block of code somewhere that says, you know, um, you know, if, I don't know, pseudocode, right? If is, uh, if I auditable, I can't even write pseudocode. My brain is a little fried here. Auditable, uh, then, and I'm, again, this is total pseudocode, right? Then set, uh, th and then uh, create date equals now, something like that, right? You know, like the, you can have that stuff, but I need that interface for I auditable. And if I built that against I entity, well, now I'm stuck, right? So I thought about it in advance, I separated out those interfaces, right? And, you know, again, I think it kind of ties back to LISCOV. It ties back to a lot of these things. But, yeah, the and Rich, you're right. I could have that I do it ID as well. Uh, and that would probably be helpful and, and be a good idea. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to show a, a slightly different example because it's, uh, you know, it's like a an object type class versus like a service type class, right? Like methods versus properties. Uh, and, and um you know, and that's uh, the interface segregation principle. I, I like it. I like to try to focus on it. Um, you know, I don't build, you know, we talked about that whole thing where, you know, we're building stuff for other people to consume later and we want to do them a favor. I don't actually do a whole lot of that. We I, we tend to build software for, in my company, you know, we build software for ourselves. Um, and so, you know, there's always that question. Well, this is what we talked about a lot on some of the earlier shows, you know, when, how far do you take these things? When, you know, how, how far do you go? And I think that this is one where I think I can slip on this a little bit at work. I'm being honest, right? I think I can, I can, I don't want to go too far off, but if I'm a little off on the interface segregation principle, it doesn't always cause me that much trouble. Okay. Um, you know, from like a maintainability standpoint, but from an extensibility standpoint, yes. And that's where you get into the difference between maintainability extensibility those are things that the solid principles really focus on and I, I guess i would say this one's a little bit more on you know sort of maintainability right but it's also about interface uh, sorry it's about dependency management right and my dependent uh, uh, sorry the solid principles are about de dependency management right and my dependencies should be simple dependencies are these things like i'm taking i need a something I, and my and it should be as simple as i need it to be Right. Or I need a service and it should be as simple as I need it to be. I shouldn't have to manage a big, complicated dependency.
Yes. Yeah. So like when, like you said, when you own all the code, you can, you might be able to recompile the interfaces if you decide like, Hey, in fact, you could have no interfaces, right? I mean, you could, you could write, right. it is exactly. def- definitely possible to write, but a lot of us over the years, and I actually would argue like I did at the beginning of the show that in the early days of .NET, I don't think we all were quite too familiar with what interfaces were for. And I think that came over, over the years that .NET has been in existence. You kind of go, huh, that's a kind of a, a helpful feature, you know, as a, I don't have to, I don't have to know, I can, I can go ahead and write code that knows that it needs to read these properties, use these properties, use these methods, but I don't have to care. I can find out later what's actually being called, right? I, it doesn't even matter to me. Um, so, you know, it is much harder when you're writing the base class library. So now there's that funny spot in the middle of where you're at work, you write things that other teams are going to use. Do you always want them coming back to you? Hey, can we add something to this interface? It's, it's hard. It's hard to think of all this stuff up front. In fact, you, we probably don't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these things, things are tough. I mean, we talk about them for code reviews as well. Like where are you picking on people? And I think Will in the chat has a question about, can we look at some code on GitHub? I don't, I don't, um, we're running up on time here, I think. So I don't know how you guys feel about doing that. It would be kind of fun actually. Um, um, but uh, you know, it's hard to say how, how complicated the code is and might, might be more than we can and, at this stage of the show, but what are you going to say? And I don't think we're trying to say that, that, if you find this, it's evil and you should stop everything you're doing. That's not what it's about, right? That's not right. what we're here. <clears throat> um, but certainly by thinking about these principles, either code that you're working with, code that you're writing, you can say to yourself, you know, maybe maybe we can make this code a little bit easier to work with. It helps you identify reasons why you're struggling with your code, I think. Instead of just looking at it and yes. going like, why is this so hard? And you don't know why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a good way to, I, honestly, I think that's a really good way to put it. Right. And, um, you know, we get better at identifying these things as we go. Um, is kind of what it comes down to, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that I think about this every day. That would be, that would be totally untrue. I mean, um, so what else do we have on this topic? It's funny. It was, uh, it's in the news every now and then, right? Oh, interface segregation principles. In the no, news? just solid principles, right? People, oh, solid principles. They come back again and again. Like it was, it some was, some people uh, love them. Some people hate them. Yeah. Right. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I said, I was reading an article today about it. We talked about that earlier. Right. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, the author was sort of down on the solid principles. Um, I don't, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, 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 and that's why I, I, we started the show the way we did, by the way. Um, there's no, no rule that says you have to use the solid principles, right? I find it helps me and my teams solve problems, right? Um, and, and if you think it can help solve problems, then it's a good principle to follow. Like really simply, uh, that's one way to put it. Another way to look at it, though, is, uh, you know, I'm wondering what you guys think about this, but it, it might be one of those things where you bounce, you go really far with something and then you bounce back to the middle a little bit. Right. And so maybe people that don't like it have seen it like like we've talked about single responsibility, interface segregation. Do we break everything down to the smallest minute level and like, you know, you could do that and you could get burned by that. And maybe you bounce back to a place where you realize, okay, this is how far, uh, and this is going to sound weird because people say like, does, does this code follow this pattern? Does that code follow this pattern? There's, there's gray areas in here, right? And it's what's the, what's the level of commitment or compliance, if that's a good word with this principle, what's the level of compliance that works well for my team, Yeah, right? right. Where we're getting things done. We're writing code um, and we're 
because because you know writing code is about trade offs. Uh, we're talking about real world scenarios here, right? We're not talking about textbook. Real world scenarios. Every day we make trade offs. Am I right? Yeah, sure. You're either you're trying to get something done. Right. Uh, well, you're not even you sure how. You're not even sure how to do something. So you sort of tinker. You get it working, <laughs> and there's a real pressure to like, well, it works, right? Can can't we just use that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, so what is the level of, of um, you know, I, I think that word isn't bad, kind of compliance with yeah. these principles or what's our level of comfort? And I said in a previous show, I think it's a good thing for a team to talk about, you know, well, what do you guys think about this uh, as an example of how we should, in, in, you know, be single responsibility or interface segregation? People go, yeah, you know, I think you're taking a little far it's you're right. We could take it further, but maybe we don't need to. Right. And as a team, you get into that, you work together and you sort of know what everybody's sort of comfortable with. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I wonder if that's part of the, the downside of solid is that people see it taking going very far. Um, right. Yeah. I th- yeah. I, uh, yeah. There's some of that. I think that's more someone who's new to it and trying to say, embrace and do the right thing. It's like, well, now those are the principles I'm going to follow. But I think as you've kind of, Andy and Chris, from all the experience you guys have had writing code, you kind of, you know, there's the right place to put it and the wrong place to put it. So, you know, yeah. that experience comes into play. And I think, Andy, to your point, you know, while we aren't doing these things together right now, but those are the things that we would, you know, we'd grab a pizza, we'd sit in the lunchroom, and we'd, we'd talk about those kind of things that we're going to, either we do them culturally together or we do them as part of this project. And we still need to have those conversations when we get started. It's just how do we do that now that they're all virtual too, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, there was a couple arguments about in the article. One was that I think it started with a sour taste because there was an interview process and the interview process was very focused on, you know, can you name the solid principles? And I don't care if you can name the solid principles, right? I will say that in an interview, this is an interview with me, how an interview with me would go. I'd say, hey, are you familiar with solid principles? I actually ask about that. I do Mm -hmm. because I think it it shows a certain level or or it can show. It's not an only indicator, but it can show a certain level of experience. And when someone says no, I usually ask follow-up questions. Hey, you never heard about solid principles. Okay, have you heard about a single responsibility principle. And sometimes I get people going, yeah. And I'm like, well, then you've heard about solid. You just don't really know it yet, right? Or we'll talk about single responsibility. They say no. And maybe we start to get into a conversation about the single response. I'm just using this one as an example because mm-hmm. it's the first one. And the developer starts to talk about the way they write code. And they say, well, you know, I'll tell you what I think. I think that code should really only do one thing, right? I don't like to have my code that's messy, right? And what I say to them is, and, you know, because my takeaway is you don't need to know what it's called right. to be doing it. Right. And I think in the case of this article, you know, the author was and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus because it's someone that I, I think is oh, a yeah. smart person. You know, um, so uh, the, the concept is you, know, you don't need to know what it's called. Right. It's kind of like saying, do I need to know what the size of an integer is? I can Google what the max value for an integer is. I don't have to have it memorized. Now, you know, and there's, there's the name it was Michael Zool, who who. Uh, you know how to, it was, and it's a, it's a good article. It's thought provoking, oh, yeah. right? That's that's one of the things I like about. It. I commented on his thing. I try not to give him too hard a time, but I I feel I'm a big fan of the solid principles, and so, um, you know, so I I think that um it can be taken too far though, right? And I don't know, you guys read it or did you? Yeah, yeah, you know, I read it, and you know, like I said, Michael has a a, a podcast. He has a newsletter. Yeah. He's a Microsoft MVP. Um, I, you know, I've certainly talked to him at, at MVP summit, you know, we're talking about definitely, a, you know, uh, I don't know that he's seen the show, but he would, he would instantly be a friend of the show. You know, yeah, we yeah, would, I'd love to have him on, don't talk about but it was yet. just really timely that he wrote a blog yes. post. Why are we still talking about solid? And, and he has some great points about like, what's the history of object oriented programming in the first place? Right, right. What problems was it solving? And are they the problems we're solving today? And I think those were all definitely worthy of consideration. And I, it was not only in the, it's in the Twitch chat now. You saw it just up on the screen, and we'll definitely include it in the YouTube um, comments because you should check it out. And you know, when we talk about the reason we come up with these, we we give you these names, right? 
um, there's another comment that that Will had about, um, and we did put it up on the screen when he talked about contrasting this with design patterns. He's probably talking about what we, you know, call the Gang of Four design patterns as a, a seminal book, mm -hmm. design patterns, right? It's, it's in hardback. It's super expensive. Um, but if you go cover to cover on it, you learn these patterns for object-oriented design because what those gentlemen had said was is we have – solved these problems again and again and what we realized is we were do we that there's a way to do this and if we give it all names strategy pattern adapter pattern flyweight pattern visitor pattern and so on because there's many in the book if we give them names then it gives us a language that we developers can refer to instead of saying andy you know that thing where you write different classes based on an interface so that we can pick them at runtime based on what we need to do Oh, the strategy pattern, right? We don't. We can cut all that cruft out and say, "Hey, I think the strategy pattern applies here." It creates a new problem in that we have to go out and evangelize these terms. We want to to teach as many people as possible, so we can speak this language and avoid some sense of like gatekeeping. Like you don't you don't know what that is. Oh, well, I don't know if you can work here. We've got to really be careful about that, right? Because we could have we could have we could keep very bright people from working with us because they just didn't happen to be able to name three patterns, you know, right. I mean, but they might use those patterns yeah, all the they, time. They're fantastic mm -hmm. developers that just, they've inherently derived them on their own without the benefit <laughs> of that book. And you're just like, right. wow, that's brilliant. You just didn't, we just didn't speak the same language. So, right. Yeah. I think that might be part of the, you know, negative focus towards a, a solid principle. But point is we said, don't just do these principles because we told you to, Follow these principles because they might solve similar problems and read what a guy like Michael says and understand the, the cons, right, and make informed decisions. Yeah, right? right. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean, what you don't ever do, I hope, is come away from any talk and, and say, I'm going to go through all my code tomorrow, like with a scalpel and mm -hmm. find all of my my violations of Livskov's substitution. I'm not even going to do that tomorrow and probably haven't done it at all. <laughs> you know what, what it is. And, and we, and I do have violations of yeah. all these things because I'm not a perfect developer, right? It, it is what it is. It's yeah, instead of, a, yeah, it's instead a way for me to say, boy, we're really struggling with this. I wonder what the problem is. You know, I wonder why this is so hard. And then you really stop and you go, Man, you know what the problem is? Is we have to inter implement this huge interface. That's the problem. So earlier tonight, Will did mention that he has an algorithms theory and discussion meetup. And you know what? You should definitely uh, that. see that too. I think that was great that he mentioned I, it. So I didn't there's see that a link by. for it. Um, well, there was a link. So the, here was a link to a comment that Meg made, but I think that that'll get you to it. I know Will was being so, uh, he was being courteous and thoughtful by saying, hey, I'm not here to bring my my meetup. I get it. I totally appreciate that. Bring it. I say bring But you know what anyway. here? We, yeah, we are here for the developer community, Will. So don't hesitate to let us know about it in the future. Um, you know, an algorithms discussion group. How cool is that? And and Bruno, a longtime friend of the show, longtime friend of Philly.net. Thank you for being yeah. here. I know it's I know it's a little bit late for him, so we won't waste any more time. Um, I guess at this point, for uh, we respect your time and thank you for being here. And so for my co-hosts, Rich Ross and Andy Schwaman, thank you, Andy, for leading this and having those code samples. I know how much work it takes. Thank you so much. We will see all of you the next time on the Dev Talk Show.